Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. On Nisquilly Hill near Olympia in Thurston County in Washington, Russell Geis and Dennis Lensgrave, both teenagers, saw a white seven-foot-tall Bigfoot in their car's headlight. The men shot at it, and large tracks and broken trees were found in the direction the creature had fled. The boy said that the bullets knocked the creature down for a moment, but that it quickly got back up on its feet and ran off. On to the next one. This was in Callum County in Washington. My name is Ken Gosline. While stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington with the 4th Infantry Division, I had an encounter with what I believe to be a bear, but now I know it was a Bigfoot. The encounter itself did not happen at Fort Lewis. We were on operations up in the Olympic National Forest prior to leaving for Vietnam. Myself and about seven other guys volunteered to play the enemy and try to sneak through the company lines. We waited till way past sunset before we attempted to infiltrate the lines. We moved extremely slow, so it had to be past midnight when we were discovered and all hell broke loose. I lucked out and was not captured. I laid under a tree, avoiding capture for well over an hour. When I finally made it back to the logging road, it had to be about 3 to 4 a.m. When I got close to my company area, I heard what I thought was another soldier coming down the side of a hill toward the logging road. I couldn't make out any details, just the outline of a big GI, if I could make out his unit. I figured he couldn't make out mine, so I figured to reverse roles here and capture him. I challenged him by yelling, Halt! Who goes there? His answer was an ungodly growl that scared the crap out of me and I took off running down the logging road, thinking it was a bear and that he was right beside me. I ran like I never ran before. I finally saw the campfire at my company area and headed for it. Not knowing about Bigfoot at the time, I told the guys I was chased by a bear. The next day, I found out I was the only one to escape capture, so it couldn't have been any of the guys out there. That growl was real, not another GI trying to scare me. I left for Vietnam in September of 1966 and got back to the world in September 1967. I remember watching a TV special in October or November of 1967 about a creature that was filmed by a Mr. Patterson in the northwest part of the U.S. At the time, it all started coming together why it looked like a large GI coming down the hill, and the real scary as heck growl. A bear standing upright coming down the hill with that slope would have been thrown forward onto all fours long before, and wouldn't have been able to cover that distance walking upright. It happened in the early morning hours. It was clear but dark, in mostly pine trees and hills. There was a dry riverbed where I was and a river by the company area. On to the next one. At Yakima in Yakima County in Washington, a youth driving in town at night saw a seven-foot-tall hairy humanoid that was standing on the road ahead. The witness braked and stopped and the car died. The hairy humanoid just stood there looking at the witness through the windshield, walked around behind the car, and then turned around and came back to the driver's window and just bent over and looked at the witness again, and then left. The car started again, and the witness sped off. On to the next one. On Badger Mountain, south of Richland, in Benton County in Washington, the service road on the west side is now a very steep dirt road that ends at the top that now services the radio communications tower. 
I was hunting on Badger Mountain, five miles south of Richland, Washington, on a cool winter spring, partly overcast sunny day. I was looking through binoculars from its summit when I noticed from the valley floor looking south a large, extremely hairy, seven and a half to eight foot tall ape-like creature walking, then suddenly running at a pace that no human could match. I followed it for four to five minutes until it disappeared into a little ravine with a creek bed running through it. Five years earlier, in 1962, as a 12-year-old, I had been hunting east of Richland, Washington, by the delta of the Yakima River, where it empties into the mighty Columbia River. It was in the middle of the winter time, with the weather close to five degrees, and encountered massive footprints that were made in the snow. I estimated at that time of the weight being between 500 to 1,000 pounds. On looking back of my two encounters, I am a firm believer that not only does Bigfoot exist, but he is using all of our natural resources to his advantage for food and shelter. I also noticed that it was walking fast than running at a very fast pace. Desert sagebrush covered the environment, I was on a mountaintop, looking down toward a creek bed running through a ravine. On to the next one. On Fort Lewis Escape and Evasion Training Area in Thurston County in Washington, three large individuals, two very large and the other about two-thirds their size, were seen. When we first saw the individuals, they were on the far side of the open meadow. I remember that there was a bright moon out because we could see features such as trees and objects well enough to return without tripping. In fact, we could see through some of the pine. That is where we saw the individuals. At first, we thought they were the capture team looking for us. They were back in the tree line when we first saw them. There was a road not far behind them and we could see what we thought were soldiers moving very slowly, not forward or back at first. When they breached the tree line, Mickles decided that we had enough space between us and them to escape if they were part of the capture team. He thought it might be some like ourselves who escaped early and got out of the boundary area. Mickles got up and started walking towards them as I followed. They were just silhouettes, but as we got closer, Mickles waved at them, then they started moving towards us faster. Not really running, just faster. Mickles called to them, and they came faster without answering. I have never heard of bears walking upright, and for sure not that fast, but I didn't know that much about bears. I did know that something wasn't right, and I was really scared. I really didn't think they were bears or people. I don't know why. I just know I've never been that terrified, and so was Mickles. We ran as fast as we could without looking back but it felt like they were gaining on us. I told Mickles to follow me and dove under and crawled up under a large, low pine tree. We just lay there. We could feel their presence, but didn't dare move. That is when we smelled this weird odor. I'm sorry I can't describe it to you. It was strong, is all I can say. We stayed there for probably 15 minutes, and then I said, let's head for the road, and we did. By that time, the maneuver was over, and we saw a bus pull up by the compound. We ran as fast as we could and caught the bus. We never looked back, except in memory. I have hunted all over the U.S., from Colorado to Illinois to Texas. What we saw the silhouettes of and smelled was not human or any bear. They had an unusually strong odor. They made no sounds. Private Mickles and myself had left the training area earlier than we were supposed to and were staying out of the training area watching the escape and evasion activity. I've thought about the incident many times in the past. At the time, neither Mickles or myself had ever heard of Bigfoot. We were in trouble for leaving the area early, so we had other things on our mind. On to the next one. on the old Brinson place, which was abandoned. This was in Lewis County in Washington. Some high school kids had parked in the driveway to the abandoned farm, the old Brinson place, for an evening of drinking beer or some kind of sexual encounter or both. They were probably necking or drinking in a car. 
they observed a tall animal standing erect observing them. It was white or perhaps gray with red eyes. As I recall, this happened on more than one occasion. When word of the Brinson monster got around, some other kids went out there with a rifle, probably a thirty thirty, in an attempt to kill it. It was spotted again and a shot was fired, but it just kept on going. As far as I know, that was the last time it was seen in that area. The incident caused some activity in the high school. There were stories and poems written about it in English class, but that, surprisingly, was about it. We didn't know about Bigfoot or Sasquatches in those days. They had not been popularized yet. People just didn't know what to make of it. Also, at about this time, some friends and I had camped out at the top of Sam Henry Mountain, about five miles west of Winlock, shining a flashlight across from one hilltop to the next. We saw a lot of eyes reflected back, but by unknown big animals, but probably deer. During the night, I remember hearing a loud branch breaking sound. It makes me wonder now what caused that, considering deer aren't usually so clumsy. This site is the interface between extensive forests, the Willapa Hills, essentially 50 miles to the ocean with not much habitation in between, and the farmland to the east which has a lot of human habitation. Other incidents were reported in the Central Chronicle several years afterward, of tracks very near a residence at Vader, Washington. This would be perhaps five miles south of the Brinson incident. That incident was also investigated by Sheriff's Officer. As I recall, the family that reported the tracks later reported UFO activity there as well. On to the next one. by the Chihalis River near Chihalis in Lewis County in Washington. A hunter by the name of Billy Brown saw a white Bigfoot that was eight feet tall. Billy shot at the creature's head and the creature ran off into the swamp screaming and later Billy found traces of what appeared to be blood. On to the next one. About three miles east of Spirit Lake near Randall in Skamania County in Washington, my grandfather, whom was familiar with this region and hunted this mountain country yearly by horseback, saw what I believe to be a Pacific Northwest Sasquatch. Although he never would say for sure what he really thought of the incident, he was very humble, except that he had seen something eye to eye that he felt confident few men had ever seen and he conveyed a deep feeling of respect for the creature. My grandfather rarely spoke of the incident, but he felt safe telling my father the details. Those who didn't believe in the creature probably never had a reason to feel otherwise, but my grandfather was an honest, humble outdoorsman who knew the backcountry of Washington, Idaho, and Oregon very well. On to the next one. in Candy Pass in the Washington Cascades in Chelan County near Little Wenatchee River in Washington. On a morning in November, Frank Kilson spotted a tall hairy humanoid in the sights of his thirty odd six rifle at a range of 75 yards. The creature was seven and a half feet tall, appeared to weigh 400 pounds, and had bowed legs. The long arms were almost reaching its knees, and it had sloping shoulders and reddish hair all over its body. The man-beast had small, dark eyes that stared at the witness. The creature also had black hair on its head, a broad, flattened nose, and protruding lips and chin. The man and the man-beast faced each other for five seconds, and then it left, leaving footprints that were 15 inches long and 7 inches across at the ball of the foot and were one and a half inches deep. Frank knew that it was not a bear, and he could not bring himself to shoot it. The creature made a grunting noise. This is a hunter, and even he reckons that this was no bear. On to the next one. My wife and I are amateur naturalists, with our home being filled with books and artifacts from years spent hiking in the woods. We have pressed leaf and fern collections castings from wolves and other animal tracks, and all kinds of other oddities collected during our many excursions throughout the years. 
We have handmade lamps made from tree limbs that we gathered in the forest, and some of our furnishings were handcrafted by artisans from the forest to our north. I only mention this so that you can kind of get a feel for the type of people we are. At the time of this sighting, our two children were nine and twelve years old, with Sophia being the oldest and Eddie was our youngest. At least twice a year we would all go camping, but we spent many other days hiking and scavenging in a variety of locations together. One of our favorite locations is the Helen Bar Lookout Trail in Mississauga Provincial Park. It's not too far from Toronto, and it is an absolutely exceptional place to hike and camp, having been there more than a dozen times before. The trail takes a few hours to traverse, so we generally bring a picnic lunch along to eat. Once we reach the midway point, typically in an area known as the Second Lookout, which is close to a lake named Helen Bar. There are many animals in this region, including deer, moose, and wolves, and it is not uncommon to see wolf tracks on this trail, because it's also used by the packs at times. In fact, this is where we had taken the casts which we have at home. Many people are afraid of wolves, but this is an unfounded fear. They are actually quite shy, and have extremely keen senses of both smell and sight. The only indication of the wolf's presence that most people will ever experience is their howling, which we've heard on many occasions. This time, we decided to travel in September. October and September are the rut seasons for the moose, and we were hoping to stay out of harm's way and actually see a moose on this outing, which is easier said than done. As large as they are, it is extremely rare to see one here. I will do my best to give you a good idea of what we were seeing and what you would see if you were there with us. The trail is a large oblong loop which heads out toward Helen Bar Lake, and then swings back around, with the return leg running along the side of Semi White Lake. These are two entirely different bodies of water, with Helen Bar being very shallow and Semi White being much deeper. Semi White is home to lake trout, whitefish, and a lot of minnows, most of which, like the deeper water, while, on the other hand, Helen Bar Lake is less than 15 feet at its deepest point, but it does support a robust population of brook trout. As you enter the trail, you get a real sense that you are leaving the world as you know it. Like entering Middle Earth or some other fantasy forest, as you begin, you move uphill, and there are many boulders that were left behind by the glaciers. They are referred to as conglomerate rock or glacial erratics. One of these rocks, which had more than likely been dragged hundreds of miles by the ice, is of immense size and proportion. There are also quite a lot of ferns growing both on and around this huge boulder. Passing the boulder field, you start to enter into the heart of an upland forest, an area filled with red oak, yellow birch, and sugar maples. All of these trees are at the extreme northern limits of where they can grow and thrive. Directly alongside of them, you begin to see what is known as the Northern Boreal Forest, where spruce and balsam firs take over. While on the trail, you walk at the very cusp of that transition zone between the two different forests, and as you continue your hike, you also begin to see many stumps which are remnants of the logging for white pine which occurred here years ago. As you continue along the route, you will see a large swath cut through the forest, which was done intentionally by the province of Ontario. The young growth which springs up in these areas provides reachable and edible food for the deer population. As you approach what is known as the first lookout, you are confronted by steep rock faces, which stand in stark contrast to the beautiful forest that surrounds them. From both the first and second lookouts, you can see the shallow and lovely Lake Helen Bar. And in this area between the two lookouts, there are many large trees which have been uprooted by the wind, leaving their enormous root balls exposed. On this day, we began our descent from the second lookout, and walked about a quarter of a mile passing many of these fallen trees, when, just up ahead of us, a large bull moose emerged from the forest, more than likely after a trip to Lake Semi-White, which is one of their favorite feeding zones. They love the aquatic plants that grow in the shallows at the lake's edges. 
He was right in our path, making mating calls as he lumbered along, and we didn't want to get too close, so we started to backtrack. As we did so, we snapped some pictures and tried to enjoy the moment while remaining cautious. He seemed as though he was not going to move on anytime soon, so we decided to back up near the area of the fallen tree and hang out for a while, since our only other alternative was to hike all the way back the way we had come. As we were waiting, Sophia told me that she had seen something come out from behind a tree. There were quite a few dead trees, so I asked her which one, and she pointed at a large root ball maybe 150 feet away from us. As we all stood there, focusing on this giant root balls, my eyes were drawn to a large, black, furry arm that was wrapped through and around some of the old roots extending from the side of this ball. No sooner that I had began focusing on it than a large head jutted out from behind the ball, looking right at us. Almost simultaneously, my daughter and wife said, Oh my God, look at that. The head started twitching back and forth in a crazy manner, moving back and forth incredibly fast. And then the arm was pulled back out of view. My daughter told me that she was scared, and both children moved closer to us. I reached down and grabbed a large piece of branch, breaking it off into a club, and as I did so, this thing took off at a frantic pace, running through the trees. It moved so quickly that it was almost a blur, and we could hear it crashing and thrashing through the trees as it ran. We were absolutely in shock, and my daughter was so frightened that she was in tears. After a long minute, she started to walk back to where the moose had been, looking back over our shoulders the entire time. Thankfully, when we reached that area again, the bull had moved on. About 45 minutes later, we were back at camp and safe. Though brief, we had a good enough look at the creature that I can describe it in detail. I would estimate that its arm was over 5 feet in length and heavily covered in what seemed to be thick, blackish-brown fur. When its head moved into view, we could see a portion of its body through the root ball of the down tree, and it looked like a big gorilla. But of course, we all know that there are no gorillas present here or anywhere else in the state. Even if one fell to earth here, it would never survive the climate. This was a Bigfoot. The head had longer hair on it than the rest of the body, and when it started flipping its head left and right, we could see that long hair flipping back and forth. It looked like a lead guitarist in the middle of some mad jam session performing this twitching motion so fast that it was hard to comprehend why it would do so, but it was. When it ran into the woods, it led with its arms and hands, plowing everything out of its way. It was like a whirlwind of activity as it parted the brush and pushed forward through the undergrowth, slapping saplings and brush aside with seemingly no regard for getting hurt. We could clearly see when it moved out of the cover of the roots that everything about its body was tall, well-formed, and muscular. The biceps and forearms looked like tree limbs, and from the front to back, its upper thighs must have been 16 inches deep, and its butt cheeks stuck out well beyond the thickness of its thighs. It was completely different from a human's buttock. Its hands and feet were extremely long, and when the feet were lifted as it stepped, I noticed that their bottoms looked like a leather shoe sole, with fur coming down the edges. At no time did it show its teeth, and when it disappeared, we could faintly hear it thrashing away for a fair amount of time before everything went silent. Of course, we don't know if it had broken into a clearing, or if it was just too far away for us to hear it, but at that point, the encounter was over. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!